Thank you, Tom. How many people have seen the ET3 presentation two or three years ago here? Um, or at the uh, Boulder uh, Denver New Tech? So maybe only about a third or fourth of the, uh, so probably I ought to focus a little bit to start with on a overview of what ET3 is. Um, ET3 is a new form of transportation, and if we go back and look at transportation, transportation is really the master key to survival. Uh, 10,000 or more years ago, Native Americans domesticated wolves so they could enjoy a little bit higher standard of living, um, pulling uh, sleds. And um, it uh, expanded their, their range. If you double the speed of travel, how much more opportunity do you have? We might think it's doubled, but in that circle, that radius of influence, we've got four times as much opportunity, the, the, the uh, um, speed squared. So every transportation advance yields a improvement in the global standard of living. Uh, th this uh, presentation will make some forward-looking statements and a uh, previous presenter here um, posted this and I think it's a good idea to uh, um, take everything I say with a grain of salt and see if it sounds reasonable to you. These are, you know, we're talking about uh, stuff that hasn't been done yet. Um, I believe it's reasonable and a lot of experts in the world believe it's reasonable and we have detractors too, so um, formulate your own opinions and don't take this as uh, um, gospel truth. Um, evacuated tube transport technologies is ET3. That's the three T's is tube transport technologies. And our vision is being able to, um, if everything's built to the same standard, to eventually be able to um, travel from uh, um, the New York area um, across the Bering Strait across Siberia, you'd arrive in Beijing, China in a couple hours, and about 45 minutes later you'd be in Delhi, and another 45 minutes you'd be in London or Paris. Um, or cargo could go the, um, the opposite way or the same way. Um, apples that uh, you pick, uh, um, or peaches here in Colorado, um, could be sent to Japan where they sell for $5 a piece. ET3 is like cars on a freeway. It's not like train on a track. The vehicles go through an interchange, just like a freeway. And they can be independently routed, um, like information through the internet. ET3 is much more comfortable. Um, th this is a uh, mock-up of the seating module. I invite anybody to uh, um, take a, uh, a look in here. Um, the mirror at the other end simulates a um, space twice as big as the physical space of this. Um, so it uh, simulates a four seat configuration. The capsule holds four, five, or six people just like a typical car. And comfort like this instead of the um, typical public transportation. Um, ET3, is th this um, $3 million uh, prop jet um, will haul six people in, uh, in comfort. That is 49 inches in diameter and 49 inches high. Uh, 49 inches wide and 49 inches high. Um, and about 15 feet long from the uh, front of the cockpit to the back of the cockpit. Um, it's designed for executive comfort. Um, that cockpit would fit inside a ET3 capsule that is um, 16 and a quarter feet long and 51 inches in diameter. Um, th th yeah, that, that will be um, in, in here, or, or a cargo um, could, could travel a pallet at a time or a stove or a refrigerator at a time. Um, the other thing to consider about ET3 is that uh, uh, manual control is the way we drive our cars now. And we have an analogy of um, telephone operators. Um, th this. Um, room full of telephone operators. Notice the chairs that they're sitting in. Um, this chair here on the left with the, is the same 100-year-old chair. 
that little router sitting on there would switch more information much more reliably than a whole building full of telephone operators. What about a whole rack full or a whole building full of racks? The um, explosion in um, communication with automation is, is phenomenal. And ET3 um, is taking up, um, and other companies like Google are taking up the automation of transportation that promises much bigger gains than automation of, of telecommunications. So I'm going to uh, start a little video here. Um, evacuated tube transport is literally space travel on Earth. And this illustrates bringing, bringing space travel conditions down to Earth. The tubes that you see here will both be elevated. There's a mistake in the animation. Uh, they'll either both be above ground or both below ground. This access portal, this airlock, allows these vehicles to enter the evacuated tubes without letting any air in. When the capsule goes into this chamber, it displaces almost all the air. This gate valve here closes. The remaining air can be removed with a vacuum pump. And then there's two gate valves here that open up. And the capsule can enter the evacuated environment. Those gate valves close and seal. Now this chamber's evacuated, and it can go and receive the inbound capsule um, without waiting to pump that uh, air out. And the capsule accelerates up to speed, just like a car merging onto a freeway. It can be routed in, in anywhere in the network, like packets of information through the internet. This is how the magnetic levitation works. These vehicles are um, hovering about an inch off of the guideway. Um, that was the prototype in China with Brendan and I riding in it. And this is yttrium barium copper oxide. It's a superconductor when it's brought down to liquid nitrogen temperature. And if it's brought into superconductive condition in a magnetic field, it levitates with almost no resistance. 10 to the negative 7 coefficient of friction. If the vehicle weighed a million pounds, the drag force would be less than a pound. So virtually friction free. Of course, it has to move the air out of the way for the vehicle to pass. So ET3 removes the aerodynamic resistance, which um, varies with the square velocity. So at uh, a 200 mile an hour train, 98% of the resistance is aerodynamic resistance just to push the air out of the way. A linear motor, of course, accelerates the vehicle up to speed, um, just like accelerating these uh, amusement rides. And then the vehicle gets up to speed, it merges into the flow of traffic, and it can be routed anywhere in that network like packets of information through the internet. When it arrives at the destination, just like a car on a freeway, you merge off onto an off-ramp, uh, um, diverge um, to an access portal. And um, when you slow down, about 90% of the electrical energy or more, depending on if superconductors are used, can be recovered when the vehicle slows back down. So ET3 can accomplish about 50 times more transportation per kilowatt hour compared to the most efficient electric car or electric train. And since this uses a automotive and a car philosophy instead of a train and a track philosophy, you are in control of your vehicle and where it stops. Just like in an elevator, when you push the button for the top floor, if you decide you want to stop at an uh, intermediate floor, you hit that button and it stops there. Same thing with ET3. You're never farther than 15 minutes from an access portal. It uses a car on a freeway philosophy. ET3 can leverage existing capacity. It's not like it was in Henry Ford's day. A hundred years ago, there was insufficient capacity to mass produce steel. So Henry Ford had to build a factory to process ore into iron. He had to build another factory to process iron into steel. He had to build another factory to make sheet metal. He had to build another factory to make body panels. He had to make a factory to make glass for the windshields. He had to make a factory to do almost everything except for, for make tires. Firestone had come up with some processes for that about the same time. So um, ET3 doesn't have to um, make those tens of billions of dollars of investment to build a whole series of factories to build this. The capacity exists now. Um, there's a company here in Loveland uh, that uh, 
um, puts in helical pier foundations. Uh, these machines in less than 15 minutes can put a support into the ground that uh, will, that small support there um, holds 25 tons. The larger support up there uh, may be closer to uh, um, two or 300 tons. The um, capacity to make pipelines exists all over the world. Uh, there are several hundred thousand miles of pipeline in the United States that invisibly and quietly and safely and reliably carry more ton miles of cargo than trains and trucks combined. It sounds pretty phenomenal until we realize that we turn the water faucet on in our bathtub and you know you fill it with a hundred pounds of water and then you flush the toilet and it uh, takes it away all through pipelines and tubes. A lot of this capacity is already proven. Who knows where this is? That's right, yeah. And not too long ago, we had the road wash out with all the flooding that took place. Um, in 1976, it took the pipe out too. The, the, uh, the, there was a, a building or a house and they made this one a little bit stronger. It withstood the, uh, um, the flood. Uh, this is some more flooding here uh, close in Lyons. And this is the railroad track that washed out uh, on right off of Highway 66 in Lyons. Uh, this is, who, who knows where this is? This is uh, right there in 66 in, in Lyons where um, a conveyor system runs inside this tube to uh, carry crushed rock. And um, you can see where the railroad track washed out uh, there and, and the uh, ballast is, is undermined, um, but the, uh, even though the river was running over the, uh, um, the tube foundations, they're, they're more or less unaffected. The reason ET3 can be built so much cheaper is using those car-sized vehicles. The car-sized vehicle was selected because it represents the best compromise between cost and utility. And that's why um, cars have displaced trains, because they offer a lot more market value than trains do. In the year 1910, 90% of Americans traveled between city by train. Now it's less than 1%. And the reason is, is cars just offered a lot more value, a lot more bang for the buck for most people. In, in addition to the convenience and not having to travel when the average of a few hundred people want to travel, but when you want to travel. So, um, if we look at the situation for ET3 for building infrastructure, this vehicle that only weighs 400 pounds empty can haul the same 800 pound payload as a typical car. Cars have won the transportation market hands down. Over 90% of people travel in the United States by car. Over 90% of the passenger miles of travel is in car sized vehicles. Over 80% of the global market is five seats plus or minus one. Why build vehicles any other size? If you don't have to pay the driver, the advantage uh, of uh, building big vehicles mostly goes away. And there's a lot of advantages to building small vehicles. This high-speed rail infrastructure here with a couple 100-ton locomotives passing on a bridge span. Any idea how much those locomotives weigh? 100 tons for a locomotive. And that's, not with, that's without the load of the um, cars behind and the, and the uh, people in it. So if you've got a couple of those 200 ton locomotives passing in a bridge span, it takes about 550 tons of concrete and steel for an 82 foot span, a 25 meter span. With ET3, that vehicle only weighs 400 pounds, but it hauls a same 800 pound payload as a typical car. So it only weighs 1,200 pounds. Two vehicles passing on a bridge span only weighs a little over a ton. That's why the ET3 infrastructure for the same two meters here only takes one ton of material. For this two meters here, it takes 35 tons of material. To support that massive load, it takes about 90 or 100 tons of concrete and steel for the vertical support. 
to support the 200 tons plus the 550 tons plus another 100 tons takes pilings, um, 24 to 30 pilings driven into the ground as deep as 250 feet in some locations to support that massive load. It can take weeks just to install the pilings. So ET3 can be put in with helical pier foundations that can be installed in 15 minutes. You bolt the pillar in place in another 15 minutes and a crane puts the small um, uh, um, eight ton load into place in another 15 minutes. It's built in factories. Much, much lower cost. Less than a tenth of the cost and still leaving plenty of profit potential for local companies like uh, um, Jeff Phillips with uh, Colorado Foundation Systems using locally available equipment instead of uh, um, labor imported from China. Proven vacuum technology too. This is the LIGO Observatory that's evacuated to a thousand times higher quality vacuum than necessary for ET3. Excuse me, a million times higher quality vacuum. 10 to the negative 9 tor and it had no measurable leaks in a period of two years without the vacuum pumps working. 50 kilometers of welds. How much vacuum do you About 10 to the negative 3 tor to 10 to the negative 4 tor is the optimal. Um, the optimal degree of vacuum, it, to create a pure vacuum cannot happen. There, there's no such thing. Um, but we can get pretty close to it uh, pretty quick. Um, removing 99% of the air is removing 99% of the resistance and that can happen very quickly with uh, really low tech uh, pumps. A single stage pump can reach 10 to the negative 3 tor um, or 10 to the negative 4 tor depending on the uh, type of pump. So. Um, after that, the cost of creating that vacuum is a hyperbolic function that reaches a vertical asymptote at a pure vacuum and taking more and more energy, infinite energy to produce a pure vacuum. So that's not practical. But the transportation energy drops very quickly as we remove the air. If we remove 99% of the air, we remove 99% of the resistance. That's not quite that good, but close. So. Um, the point where those two energy cost graphs cross is the optimal level of vacuum. And um, our um, approximations give a range of a factor of 10, uh, about 10 to the negative 3 tor to 10 to the negative 4 tor, about a millionth of an atmosphere or one ten millionth of an atmosphere of, of, uh, um, of pressure. Linear electric motors like they use in roller coasters are um, as much as 97% efficient at converting electrical energy into kinetic energy and that's without using superconductor elements. So if we don't use, if we use copper elements um, we can recover uh, estimated 90% of the energy when the vehicle slows down uh, linear generator at the other end also 95% efficient. Um, but if superconductors are used which now superconductors have been demonstrated that for carrying a certain amount of amps of current are cheaper than copper now. So using superconductor elements we can recover 98 percent of the energy and that's accounting for the liquid nitrogen that it takes to keep those superconductors cool. Proven magnetic levitation technology. You saw the vehicle that Brenda and I were riding in. It's hovering about uh, three quarters of an inch off of the uh, permanent magnetic guideway. Those permanent magnets will retain estimated 500, uh, excuse me, estimated 90 percent of their field strength for about 500 years at room temperature. This is a local company, Ability Composites, and they have filament winding equipment that can um, wind uh, Kevlar or fiberglass or carbon fiber around a mandrel and make uh, capsule shaped and sized vehicles for making aerospace parts like rocket motors or uh, um, race car drive shafts or all kinds of parts that require winding uh, um, fibers pulled through a, a resin bath. And this is an autoclave that a capsule, um, ET3 capsule could fit inside of that uh, um, bakes it at high temperature and high pressure necessary to make um, extremely high strength to weight ratio parts. 
and uh, Frank Roundy is the uh, president of the company. This is when Fox News was there all day long, um, showing how local capacities can be used to uh, build ET3. Since local capacities can be used, we've adopted an open consortium model. Uh, this is uh, one of our advisors, is Frank Davidson. He's the guy that uh, actually, his wife, Iseline, um, had the idea after a particularly harrowing um, crossing of the English Channel shortly after the war. Frank uh, was 17 years old and he couldn't join the U.S. military, so he went to Canada and joined the military, and he was at the Normandy in invasion where he met in France his wife, Iseline. And after that crossing where they were coming into Portsmouth, I believe, and as the ship was sinking, it was bouncing off the bottom and, and water was coming in over the, over the sides right as they were coming into the port. And um, she said, Frank, your dad was a famous engineer that built the 20-foot diameter tunnel to carry water from the Catskill Mountains to New York City have him build a tunnel big enough to drive a train through <laughs> so we don't have to put up with this uh, bad weather and stuff. So he took it seriously and it took him 35 years but he founded the English Channel Tunnel Study Group and got that tunnel built across the uh, English Channel. And he's told me, he said, as difficult as that tunnel process was technically, the technical difficulties were only maybe 10 or 20 percent of the problems of building it. It's mostly diplomacy and, and political problems to get a lot of stakeholders to come together. So we, we've adopted an open consortium model that is creating tremendous capacity um, or tr tremendous new market potential for tens of billions of dollars in production capacity that already exist tens of billions, if not trillions of dollars of right-of-way that already exist. There's a couple hundred miles of power line right-of-way in the United States. There's 53,000 miles of interstate highway in the United States. Chances are at least some of those right-of-ways that have already been paid for can also be used for ET3 without interrupting their existing use, creating a new market for existing investments. Instead of asking people to pull money out of their pocket, we're creating a new market for those past investments that have already been made through open consortium model. This is Dr. Kamada. He's a famous physicist from Japan. And ET3 is creating a new market for his magnetic expertise. He held for some time the world record at focusing a permanent magnetic field at four and a half Tesla. His wife, uh, Yumi, um, has a company that makes uh, um, LED light bulbs in Taiwan. Um, this is the team that uh, um, uh, Professor Wong and his wife on the left are the inventors of high temperature superconductor maglev in China. And um, ET3 enables their technology to be used. It was kind of dead end because um, that cold surface on that vehicle, any moisture in the air condenses on that cold surface and builds up a layer of ice at that liquid nitrogen temperature and pretty soon that layer of ice chokes the suspension gap. So that technology was dead end without ET3. So they invited us to China clear back in uh, 2002, 2003. We spent uh, um, a, uh, uh, about five months in, in China. And um, since then, we've expanded out programs to several universities. School of Mines has had uh, um, uh, several dozen teams of four or five students working on different uh, ET3 projects. Um, what's the cost of ET3? We already went over a lot of those factors um, showing why the cost is so much less. Uh, um, Dr. Fry mentioned uh, um, Hyperloop a, a while ago. Um, Hyperloop is in two sizes. One for capsules big enough to carry cars in, the other bus sized um, vehicles that will haul 30 people at a time. The um, optimization of ET3 really stipulates that we keep careful control of the size of the diameter of the tube because the cost scales not with the diameter. If you double the diameter, it's not double the cost. 
there's four times as much material in it too because it has to be twice as thick as it grows twice in diameter to maintain the, the same stress level of those materials. But it gets worse than that because now since the cost is greater you're going to be making fewer miles for that big machine and the machine costs a lot more too to build. So the tooling cost divided by the, the amortization makes the cost scale with approximately the diameter cubed. So twice the diameter is eight times the cost. If the cost basis for these two tubes is 100. The cost basis for these tubes is three times as much, 315. The cost basis for the larger variant of Hyperloop is 10 times greater. And we already saw why the cost of high-speed rail is so much greater because um, 100 ton vehicles here, um, 30 ton vehicles here, 15 ton vehicles here, less than one ton vehicles here. So, um, and how many arrived here this evening by bus? Raise your hand. Is anybody here, does anybody here prefer to ride by bus than by taxi, if given a choice? Maybe because of the cost. But what if it costs as much as riding a taxi to take a bus and as much as taking a bus to ride in a taxi. Wouldn't you much, much rather ride the taxi? So that is part of the reason why the size of the vehicle is so critical. Market um, says that it's the best, um, car sized vehicles are the best um, balance of comfort, best balance of uh, cost and utility that, that exists, much better than buses and much better than trains. And that's why trains have been displaced to niche markets. However, if we listen to the rail industry, that's not the truth. So, so remember that forward-looking statement. The rail industry would have us believe that trains are the answer to our congestion problems. I believe that it's a case of the emperor has no clothes. Remember the Hans Christian Andersen story when you were a kid? The little kid pointed out that everybody had a vested interest in the emperor's clothes. The same thing with the rail industry. The rail industry would have us believe that trains are the answer to congestion. If that is the case, why don't we ask them why it is that trains had market share, passenger trains carried 90% of people between cities in the year 1910. Why has it declined to 1% now? It, it's it's the, the value proposition. You can lie to some of the people some of the time. You cannot lie to all the people all the time. So as long as they only lie to 1% of the people, we don't mind pulling the money out of our pocket to pay. Everybody pays, so only a few can benefit. So I have a question. What's the capacity issue here? I'm glad you brought that up. The, uh, the, the, the capacity issue, um, yeah, 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 e ET3, since it operates like a car on a freeway, it's not limited in vehicle frequency by that switch, like a train is, that has to physically move the track from one track to another. That switch that takes maybe a minute or two to operate, um, if it should stick halfway, it has to warn the train, otherwise the train runs right off the end of the track. So that limits the frequency of vehicles that can use that horrifically expensive infrastructure to one train maybe every five or six minutes with automation, but typically one train every 15 minutes is typical, maximum capacity for a um, train track. ET3 operates with an interchange philosophy where the infrastructure, the track is dumb, like a road. And the vehicle controls the path of travel, random access, in or out. With automation, we can see that the capacity is much, much greater than the car, cars on a road. The uh, capacity, safe capacity of a road because of human um, frailties and reaction time and all those types of things and um, you know attention span and it, it limits the safe frequency of a freeway to one vehicle per lane every two seconds. Two seconds is the recommended um, following distance. Of course 
and during rush hour, sometimes it operates beyond that safe capacity. Um, so if a four-lane freeway then has a vehicle capacity of one vehicle per lane per sec, or one vehicle um, in each direction um, per second, one vehicle a second, with ET3 operating at 350 miles an hour, that's 519 feet per second, keep that in mind, if the length of the vehicle is 16 and a quarter feet, physically with automation, um, a computer can make thousands of decisions while that vehicle goes an inch or two. So we can control that vehicle at 4,000 miles an hour within plus or minus an inch or two of accuracy. So let's give it um, 16 and two-thirds feet. But now let's say we don't want to use that full capacity because we want to maintain some capacity in the system in case there's an emergency somewhere. So let's only use one-third the capacity. That would al allow us to merge two vehicles in between any two vehicles in the system for, for safety reasons. If there's a breakdown in the system, we can reroute traffic, even if it's operating at maximum capacity. So now we have 50-foot spacing, 16 and two-thirds times three, from the nose of one vehicle to the nose of the next vehicle 50 feet. At 350 miles an hour, how many feet per how many uh, feet per second is that? 519. So, how many vehicles per second is the capacity? Divide 50 into 500. 10 vehicles per second. 10 vehicles per second moving 350 miles an hour. What's the capacity of a freeway? One vehicle per second. So, so that little pair of tubes there operating at 350 miles an hour can carry 10 times as much as that train track, the very expensive train track, or 10 times the capacity of a four-lane freeway. We need more capacity on our freeways. But we probably don't need 40 lanes worth, 20 lanes in each direction. Now, if we scale the speed, if we double the speed from 500 feet per second to 1,000 feet per second, 700 miles an hour, we double the capacity. We can merge two tubes together because now the, the speed grows to still 10 vehicles a second, 1,000 feet per second. Now we got 100 foot spacing. So at 4,000 miles an hour, that pair of five foot diameter tubes going across the Bering Strait could carry 120 vehicles per second in each direction. If each one of those were loaded with only one pallet of cargo, they could carry more cargo, five times more capacity than all the container ships operating between China and the United States. So shippers are out of business. Maybe not. Uh, another practical question. How do you air condition that space within the cabin? Just, just like uh, spacecraft or uh, submarines, uh, off-the-shelf technology for removing carbon dioxide, so buying oxygen. Um, vacuums are very good insulation, so we don't have to add much heat or cooling capacity. And, and do they have to get out to use the washrooms or the bathroom? Yeah, yeah, you're in control of your vehicle, just like that elevator. If you want to stop at the next access portal, which is never farther than 15 minutes spacing, just like exits on a freeway, um, you, you uh, stop it, get out, and just like you do in your car. So I just missed, I think I just missed what you said. What was the point in the 50 feet between the capsules at 350 miles an hour? Is that how long it takes to stop? <laughs> no. No, if, if the vehicles have to stop, if there's a, a, a disruption in the system, um, the safety factor is only for capacity. If we have to reroute traffic, it can be rerouted. Okay. And, and um, there's always reserve capacity available for two simultaneous failures, not just one. Right. So, so um, but the issue of a, a, a sudden stop, since it's automated, all those vehicles are in coherent flow. They all operate at precisely the design speed. Not a little bit over, not a little bit under. So they can all, if, if there's a sudden catastrophic failure somewhere, like a meteorite or a 747 crashes into the tube or, or whatever, that in, instead of a bridge falling into the Mississippi River, which happened not too long ago, um, and it might take an hour or two for the crew to get out there and put up the detour signs, with automation that can happen in less than a second. and that particular branch of tube that's affected can be isolated before the air gets to that location and traffic routed around it. Right, right. 
so if, if, if it's a network. So then for the vehicles that are in that branch already, every place that there is a vacuum pump, the air can be readmitted to the tube. The size of those apertures are spaced and, and um, sized such that the air flowing in aerodynamically slows the vehicles all down at a uniform rate together at once at a survivable rate. And you might have a, two or three of them go out the end of the tube, but most of them will just be brought down to um, a, a stop. And, and then that air cushion between all those vehicles acts like a big giant uh, airbag, maybe 500 or 1,000 feet long. So we'll keep moving through this, and there'll be uh, some time for presentation for questions after the presentation. If we have to tunnel a, a maglev train that goes uh, 350 miles an hour, displaces air pretty quickly because that big train. So if you had two trains passing in a tunnel, that tunnel has to be enormous to prevent discomfort on people's ears and and uh, um, shocks on the side of the vehicle and and, and such. So. ET3, when tunneling is necessary, this is 17.86 times more rock to remove for this infrastructure that carries a tenth as many people. So this is the question of the capacity of comparison, and, and that's only maybe um, 20 lanes of traffic in, in, uh, instead of 40 lanes. So, so th th that pair of tubes would have more than double the capacity, or would have that capacity at only a 200 mile an hour uh, design speed. Hmm? Was that photo it, it was photoshopped. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, there, there's very few places where there, there's roads that, 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 that much, that many lanes. Um, this is market share. Um, in a log scale distance of a tenth of a kilometer, one kilometer, ten kilometers, up to uh, um, 10,000 kilometers over here. And market share from 0% up to 100%. The yellow curve is air travel. This curve is automobile travel. And this curve is muscle power, um, walking or bicycles. So we see right now there's a market gap right here at maybe two tenths of a kilometer distance where it's too far to walk but not far enough to drive. And that's where we see automation and transportation taking place with moving walkways at airports, with ski lifts, um, things like that. So we see the sweet spot for ET3 being out here where it's too far to drive but not far enough to fly. Starting at a couple hundred miles we start seeing people fly and then a 50 percent at maybe that's a thousand kilometers so maybe six or seven hundred miles is that decision point where it's 50-50, flip a coin. And with TSA and all that it's probably moved up just a little bit. <laughs> so so um, we see that as being the sweet spot for ET3 is, is, is that trip length. And um, Elon Musk agrees with the, the Hyperloop that he, he sees that, you know, LA to San Francisco being a really uh, good route. And then, um, but ET3 can survive a lot, uh, a lot more. It can go a lot farther down into this territory, um, taking market share from cars eventually. Eventually, as much as 90% of transportation for both goods and people can be displaced with ET3 because it's so much more value. 50 times more transportation per unit of energy. And it's electrical energy. It can be generated um, with, uh, you know, solar or other modes. Um, hydroelectric, probably the best. Or cargo. Of, of the $8.65 trillion that's spent annually on transportation on a global basis, about half is spent to move cargo and half is spent to move people. Wouldn't it be better instead of taking all of those pallets and putting 30 or 40 pallets into a shipping container? Wouldn't it be better just to load it from a forklift directly into an ET3 capsule? That's not an ET3 capsule and that's not a, a, a pallet. That's a very mis expensive mistake. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's already proven that small vehicles, car-sized vehicles, carry everything that is taken to Walmart and Home Depot in um, container-sized vehicles. 
if you don't have to pay the driver, the advantage of the big vehicles mostly goes away. And most of those items can be transported with cars, pickups, and SUVs. What four or five guys could get around and pick up and put in the back of an ox cart is about what four or five guys can get around and pick it up and put it in a pickup. And loads are broken into those sizes. Or it's what can fit into an ET3 capsule. This is the capacity of vehicles that statistically every vehicle sold in the United States, and this information is maybe five or six years old, so it might um, be a little bit slightly different now. That's load capacity in pounds from zero pounds up to uh, 1,400 pounds at the top of the scale. The average vehicle has a load capacity of 858 pounds, and that includes the fuel load. So you can see it's remarkably uh, flat. It, it's a um, Gaussian distribution. So why build the vehicles any other size than what the market prefers? Capacity of uh, 900 pounds of cargo or 800 pounds of people because you have 100 pounds of seats and life support equipment or a pallet at a time. Or a vehicle like this that was at the uh, Da Vinci Inventor Showcase a couple years ago. Um, wouldn't it be easy to make that with retractable gear and that 200 mile per gallon vehicle could drive right into an ET3 capsule that didn't have any uh, um, seating module in it? And then you have your vehicle when you get to your destination? For the first and last mile? 90% of Americans are within 15 minutes of a Walmart store. So if you could get to your local Walmart in a small electric vehicle that could drive right into a capsule, in two or three hours you could be in Beijing, China, or New Delhi, and at a cost of a tenth the cost of flying. So where's the first ET3 project going to be? What we need is three miles for a 375 mile an hour demonstration. To showcase all of the elements at world record maglev speed right now is 363 miles an hour and um, we're going to uh, um, bump that up a little bit to maybe even 400 miles an hour. Um, it takes about a mile for that acceleration, a mile to slow back down and then a, during the mile at the vehicle's coasting we will have two alternate paths in that tube where we can prove that the vehicle can diverge and then reconverge or stay on that path. That showcases all of the elements necessary to network ET3 on a um, regional basis at those design speeds. It can be built along railroad tracks like you saw in the last slide or along existing power lines. If we pick, if we can find a location with 60,000 cars a day, um, which there's a lot of locations in the United States, if, if a freeway needs to be expanded from two lanes up to three lanes, that's about where that occurs. Um, with 30 passengers per hour um, and 16 hours, 360 days a year at $100 per person, that's $17.5 million revenue from ET3 as an amusement ride. And um, that demonstration could, uh, could pay for itself. Um, the capacity of a single tube with a single capsule just going back and forth is 120 passengers per hour. So only using one-fourth of the capacity would, uh, would pay for itself in a couple years of operation. Disney is 18 million visitors a year. Um, the capacity, if we had two tubes and a couple airlocks at each end, would be 1,660 passengers per hour. The cost for doing that is $32 million for making a two-tube system in two stages. The first stage with a single tube is about $15 million plus a couple million dollars for the, uh, for the right of way. Our immediate needs, our uh, CFO um, just uh, retired and uh, I, I, I'm not sure if for um, health reasons or, or otherwise, we are looking for a new CFO. Uh, we're also looking for some people with international law experience. Um, we are looking for right away still. Um, we think we have it and then people like BLM throw another um, wrench in the monkey works. Uh, they 
told us initially to rely on this online map that was the gospel truth of where the BLM property boundaries were, which we did. And we spent a lot of money um, because they were, they said, yes, you can use this land. Well, we got all of our application done, perfected all the surveys done for that route. And guess what? They said, oh, by the way, we don't own the last uh, half mile of the route that you need. It's private ground. The map is wrong. Sorry. So um, now we've got to either make a tunnel to um, expand that out, which will maybe cost, add another million dollars to the cost or find some other alternatives. So we're, we're still looking for better, better right-of-way alternatives, but we, we think we're getting close uh, um, on one location and there, there might be some other um, alternatives um, as well. And we're hoping some alternatives here in Colorado might open up. We were kind of thrown under the train on, on the uh, um, I-70 uh, corridor. Um, we're also looking for um, ERP experts. Uh, ET3 is an open consortium, so anybody can get involved, but it's kind of difficult to figure out um, you know, the management of, of all that stuff. So there are online systems that, that uh, we believe that we can put to use. It would be great if we had them now before we could afford it. So um, if, if there's people with those kind of uh, skills that can put that stuff together, that's the type of things that we're looking for that we are um, able to compensate uh, people with shares of ownership in the company um, to achieve these things. And that's how we've grown as an open consortium. There are now 345 licensees in 22 countries and about a third of the licensees have earned shares of ownership by providing value and building the assets of ET3 um, through uh, building the websites and uh, um, contributing technology. Um, there's a 6% value added royalty. If you figure out a way to make money with ET3, if it expands your market for vacuum pumps or making pipelines or tubes, um, join the consortium. The license is a $500 corporate fee or $100 per individual and the corporate fee is up to five in the company, can be licensed, and then that's scalable um, in units of uh, $100 or one person, one seat, kind of like buying software. It's an inclusive license, not an exclusive license. So um, it's, it's an open consortium model. And then if uh, you can sell your vacuum pumps that sell in the market for $1,000 now, if you add $60 to that, the end consumer ends up paying your 6% value added royalty that goes to ET3. And that's the cost of uh, the license. So if you have intellectual property that can improve ET3, half of that 6% royalty that's paid goes to the technology holders. So it's continual improvement uh, um, dimming. Uh, 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 we started out with uh, one patent and then uh, filed a couple more. Um, now there are over two dozen patents in the IP portfolio, most of those from other licensees. For instance, the magnetic levitation system in, in China. So it is, ET3 is a tremendous new market for existing investments in infrastructure and capacity building capacities, but also for intellectual properties. And this, this is modeled a little bit after what IBM has done with niche strategic technology licensing. IBM has more patents than any other company in the world. Over a million patents last I heard. And they license those out over and over and over to multiple companies that do not compete with them and do not compete with each other in specific niches and it brings over a billion dollars to the bottom line in windfall profit that is above and beyond what IBM developed those patents for in the first place. And as more and more of these connections are building with IP reuse, it creates even more opportunity. The, the intellectual property can expand far faster than real property, the value of intellectual property, and it's infinite. There's not a fixed amount of it. That's why the value of intellectual property in the United States surpassed the value of real property in 1993, which is staggering to consider. When we see all the buildings and fancy cars and stuff, 
the value of intellectual property surpassed that in 1993. Half of um, the world's income in intellectual property licensing flows to the United States. It is the source of our wealth. The, company that's, the country that's number two is Japan. And we make three times as much in intellectual property licensing as Japan does. India and China are catching up quick. Many more patents issued in those countries than in the United States now. Some of our barriers to our immediate needs is right now um, we're limited by SEC rules um, and regulations. It would be illegal for me to ask for investment unless I first can prove that the person I'm asking is an accredited investor. The deck is stacked against small companies in the United States and it is likely to remain that way. So we are using shares of ownership in an exemption from registration. It's rule 701 of the SEC that allows us to compensate people directly with shares of ownership in the company. It is limited to one year or $1 million in compensatory value per year. What are some of the possible future effects of ET3, P future economic effects? How much do people spend on cell phones? <laughs> Quite a bit. I mean, uh, telecommunications and the internet and all that has been responsible for a tremendous amount of value creation and wealth creation. But how much do people spend on their cars? We're talking about a revolution in transportation. $8.65 trillion a year is spent globally on transportation. Half to move people, half to move cargo. This is going to take trillions of dollars to build out the global network so a person could get from any city to any other city in four hours or less. And, and they stop 15 minutes and burns the street <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so, um, th this, this line right here is all done at a design speed of 600 miles an hour. And it connects a lot of the um, major cities on the left coast and the southern United States with the, uh, um, with, with the right coast, um, the big population centers. And, and then this is a great circle straight line route um, from the New York area to uh, in between San Francisco and LA area connecting the major population centers that could be at 4,000 miles an hour and these radius curves are 4,000 mile an hour radius um, th this radius curve right here that looks like a sharp corner is 600 mile an hour radius What's your and here's the global the global network that connects the most people and the most production centers with the minimal amounts of, of network What's the maximum speed? Uh, 4,000 miles an hour um, is not necessarily the maximum speed, but it's the, maybe the maximum practical speed. At 15 minute uh, intervals, that's 1,000 mile um, spacing. So what we're doing is we are bringing space travel conditions down to Earth so that everybody can enjoy them on a daily basis instead of a few lucky astronauts. It's already proven. Right now, we're moving 67,000 miles an hour in orbit on spaceship Earth. And we've been doing that in our entire lives. The average human travels 300 billion miles through space during a typical lifetime without burning a drop of gasoline. <laughs> All we're doing is mimicking nature. We believe that it's already proven. And we need your help to get it done. Could you repeat the number? How many miles? About 300 billion miles per lifetime. Wow. <laughs> and, and the ton mile efficiency that we're claiming for ET3 is only about one fourth of the ton mile efficiency that has already been demonstrated by, guess what? Anybody with a guess? Voyager. Does anybody know the name Voyager? Voyager spacecraft left the solar system at what, maybe 15 years ago. It was beyond the solar system. 
and it's gone uh, millions of miles, billion, maybe more than a billion miles. I, I don't know exactly how. When, when I did the calculation at that time, which was maybe three or four years ago, it had about four times a ton mile efficiency from that little blast of uh, rocket fuel to get off the ground and out of the Earth's gravity well. Um, so that, that, that's really the, the, uh, the presentation. If there's any uh, um, questions, I can um, spend a few minutes answering questions, or people can hang around and get in and out of this thing and those types of things. I'm interested in entry and exit. So in your early animation, obviously the tube's got to be taken off the main line. We've got an exit ramp, and then we've got a portal of some, of some sort. What's, uh, What's your downtime? So you've got that, okay, I got to pee, I'm um, 15 mm, minutes yep. from my next exit, mm -hmm. and once I get to that exit, what's it going to take to get me out of that capsule? Well, 15 minutes is the maximum interval. The average interval is going to be half that. So, so um, it, it, we, we've got, uh, you know, seven and a half minutes there. Um, that airlock, well, it, it takes uh, roughly 20 seconds to decelerate from 350 miles an hour um, down to zero. It takes three minutes to decelerate from 4,000 miles an hour at 1G down to zero. So we got a maximum there of three minutes. It takes 26 seconds for the airlock to cycle. So, and, and then um, the, the seating module is going to have to be extracted. That's another few seconds. It might take, uh, there might be a minute of, of time overhead um, typically. From the, time I, from the time I'm dead stop zero miles an hour stopped to put my foot back on the ground maybe about Yeah. Okay, so the question is, what's the biggest difference uh, between Hyperloop and ET3 besides the tube size? Yes. Um, probably the biggest difference is that uh, um, Hyperloop is a hybrid pneumatic system and evacuated system. Um, the proposal is to remove either 99% of the air or 99.9% .9 of the air, depending on where you read in the disclosure. Um, either one's a mistake or, or there's a range there. No, th this, this is for a Hyperloop, okay. is the proposal. So there's still residual air in there. Let's say it's 1%. So the Hyperloop vehicle then takes a giant, uh, like, four or 500 horsepower electric motor that turns a series of fans to compress that air that's one one hundredth of an atmosphere to atmospheric pressure for the um, occupants to, uh, to breathe. And also it's exhausted out of little tiny holes in the bottom of skis that the vehicle rides on inside of these steel tubes that have a film of air that is about a half a millimeter thick. So that tube is going to have to be made extremely accurately, maybe with a you know ground and improved surface on the inside of that tube um, to operate that air bearing and, and those real tight clearances. ET3, the vehicles are magnetically levitated instead of being um, supported on an air film. So, so um, the Hyperloop system that air is circulating at 350 miles an hour, and then the vehicle travels 350 miles an hour through that air. So you get a 700 mile an hour total speed. So it's going to take quite a bit of energy also to circulate that air um, and you know, overcome those, uh, um, th that resistance of all that air on the entire surface of the tube, even if no vehicles are using it. So there's a lot of big differences with, with Hyperloop. Hyperloop then has to carry a battery big enough to um, run that electric motor for the entire time. And then you have chained dependencies. The electric motor is dependent on the battery and dependent on the controller and dependent on the wiring going between them. And the turbine is dependent on everything there also. Any failure in any of those systems and that vehicle comes to a halt and the passengers lose their air pressure. So um, ET3 e e is a lot more refined than the Hyperloop idea that's only you know, one paper, a very good idea. 
And, and we really are very happy that Elon Musk has had the courage to take on the high-speed rail and, and make a stand against th that, that big boondoggle that, that's going to siphon um, billions of taxpayer dollars away and off to uh, places like China that are building those trains. Okay. So this, okay. Have you studied the physiological impact of this fast acceleration and deceleration? Um, yes. Um, in cars, which are the proven form of transportation that have displaced trains, the rail industry would have you believe that passengers cannot withstand more than a tenth of a G of acceleration or deceleration. And that's probably true if you're standing up. But virtually any car on the road, if you step on the brakes full force, will slow down and stop at about one G of deceleration. Uh, most uh, exotic sports luxury cars will accelerate initially at about one G of acceleration. So using just what's proven with automobiles is, is what we are using as the maximum acceleration for ET3. Yeah, 1G acceleration or deceleration. If you hit it, how many have hit a pothole and it jars your teeth loose? Um, a SUV is designed with three Gs of suspension um, cushion, typically, before the suspension bottoms out. A typical car is two Gs. So, so um, if you crawl up underneath almost any car, you'll see where those rubber bumpers hit against the frame and you'll see it's polished it off. That's how often we experience that kind of... ET3 will be much smoother. The tubes are automatically aligned. John, Mr. Hayes, who spent a lot of time building a, a model of this, did you want to say something about that, the, the project that you worked on? Um, sure. Uh, uh, Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> this is your 15 minutes of pain here. So. <laughs> Um, I just tell about your project and how you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I just graduated from high school um, this May, actually. So yeah. I'm 18. Um, I my school gave me the opportunity to do a project where I was given six weeks to um, do any subject or learn about any subject that I wanted and. I'm uh, doing research, I wanted to do kind of uh, like an engineering project and I uh, wanted to do something that was, I wanted to learn about something that was like life changing. So my dad uh, and my mom introduced, int uh, showed me like the Hyperloop with Elon Musk and then doing more research on it, it led me to uh, Daryl Oyster here and, and just like learning about his technology about the Hyperloop and, uh, I mean, I'm sorry about uh, the evacuate tube transport. I just saw like how advanced it was and just how effective uh, this technology could be to, our f be to the future and stuff. So um, I was lucky enough to meet this man and uh, learn a lot about it. Um, he gave me a lot of information and uh, he showed me a similar presentation a little while back. Uh, not as, not uh, as thorough as this one, but uh, it was really, really cool. I was able to uh, uh, build a smaller not exact like replica of ET3, but uh, I was able to build uh, smaller projects that represented the components, like for example the maglev system. I built a smaller one of that with a like, magnetic track and it showed uh, what the, a superconductor would do when dipped in liquid nitrogen and how it would flow, and uh, as well as I uh, built a, like a vacuum system too to show, uh, I had two, two tubes, one was a vacuum system and one wasn't and I'd show like how uh, air resistance can one slow down uh, vac uh, slow down like a capsule and two like how much more energy you need to like push that capsule then forward to match that speed so um, I just really am impressed by this technology and stuff and honestly I can see this being the future so yeah. Well, you'll be writing it. <laughs> I, I also want to say that Mr. Hayes is a, uh, um, a, a martial arts expert too, and, and uh, <laughs> is uh, I, I think uh, um, has won several uh, tournaments and, and uh, very accomplished uh, in, in both uh, physical uh, and mental exercises. Thank you. All right. Uh, 
Yeah, we, we have uh, some time here to actually have people to sit in this too and uh, get a feel for it if you haven't done that yet. And, uh, and there, I'm sure you have lots of extra questions. So, But uh, um, we wanted to kind of wrap things up here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, uh, get to know the other people in the room. There's a lot of talented people here and uh, look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you very much for coming.